got the ministry of the Lord. And the kids had their own special worship and, and time of church, face painting, and they got ministered to while they were there too. So praise God for that. Amen. They captured the vision. And I tell everybody that the love project is, is the baby that the Lord gives me every year. And so the pastor, we called to check on him and see how it went and was telling him we was praying for him beforehand. He said, I need to talk to you later after. And we said, okay. He said, just so you know, your baby had a grandbaby this week. So praise God for that. Amen. The legacy continues. So I tell you all that to say this. After the uh, revival in Bastion, I was praying and Jeremy was praying. And I told Jeremy, I said, Jeremy, I really feel like we need to go by way of Hazard, Kentucky on the way home. We're not too far from here. Let's go home that direction. And he said, okay. And I said, I believe that's the next site for the Love Project, Hazard, Kentucky. And I said, okay. Well, we don't bit more know anybody in Hazard than the man on the moon, but we got Jesus. So here we are. We take off to Hazard. We hit the county line, which is Perry County, and I started praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you don't know how to pray, you got to go to the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I'm praying in the Holy Ghost, and I said, Father, you know, you lead God and direct me, and I just started praying. And we didn't say another English word in the car. We were just seeking after God because the Bible says that he'll order our steps of the righteous, right? And so God was ordering my steps. And so all of a sudden in my spirit, I felt led to research the newspaper, that I was to go to the newspaper, and that I would be directed to a church. Well, the only way I knew how to get up to where the newspaper was to use my little Google Maps. So I'm plugging in the new, uh, asking for a newspaper for Perry County. Well, wouldn't you know, Google didn't realize that they had done changed buildings. So I show up at the building that's supposed to be the newspaper, come to find out it's the radio station. And there are four local radio news stations in that one building. Come on, that's my Jesus right there. So here I go, and I go to the front desk, and the, um, Kasia, our worship, part-time worship leader, was with us, and she said, what are you going to go do? And she said, they don't know you. I said, we're just going to go with Jesus. So we walk in the door, and the lady reception, I explained why I was there, what I was doing there, who I was, and our ministry, the whole nine yards, and as many as about three minutes, because people will cut you off in three minutes, but you're not allowed to cut me off yet. So with that, she said, well, this is the television station here. She said, but we want to do an interview. I said, well, wait a minute. We got to make sure that they want us to come to Perry County first. And she said, well, as soon as you get all them details worked out, we want you to come and do an interview. I said, look what God done done. Amen. I said, all right. She said, okay, well, let me send you here. Well, I go and I get the address and I put it in my little GPS and I'm having trouble finding this building. So I end up having to park the car and walk there. So when I walked there, I wasn't, I guess, paying close enough attention. I didn't even see a, a sign in the lobby that told me radio station to the left and newspaper to the right. I, didn't, I promise y'all, I did not see that sign. I believe that the Lord just shielded my eyes because I walked over to the radio station side. And there wasn't a reception there that day. There was another lady at a desk, and really you could tell it wasn't her desk. She was just answering the phone. And so I waited patiently till she got off the phone. And she said, ma'am, can I help you? And I explained to her why I was there, that I felt the Lord was leading us to Perry County, and we had been driving in the county and just felt led. And we were looking for a host church. Does she know any host churches in the area that's ever hosted events like this? And if she could give us some leads or guides or direction to the area. And she said, you know what? We want to do an interview. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> we got to find a host church. And she said, well, we have all the local radio stations here housed under this one building. Me and my husband own these radio stations in the building. I was talking to the owner and didn't even know it. I said, look what God done done. So she said, the more we talk, I just know, I just feel in my spirit that you, she was a Christian. She said, I feel like you need to go by and speak with whoever's there at this church. She gives, gives me the name. She gives me a lead uh, contact information. And so I didn't get a phone call answer right away. Well, here I am. I'm going on to the property, you know, because I just feel like the Lord wants me to go. So I go and I show up and here I am, you know, I'm, I'm just going with Jesus. They can throw me out if I need to. So I go in and the fellowship hall door was open. So I walked on in and there sit two ladies. And these two ladies are organizers for the county for children's food safety and 
security. And that what they're doing is they're organizing events for the summer for the children to make sure that they have food while they're out of school and also to make sure that they're safe. Um, if they have a safe place to go if mom and dad's having to work. Little did I know who I was talking to that day. She said, ma'am, you need to go right down there, and there's a gentleman down there at their food bank. That's who you need to talk to. And I said, okay. So I walk on outside, and I explain my situation to him. He said, well, let's go back up to the building. I have some numbers that I need to give you. So we walk back up to the building. And once again, the first uh, in, uh, contact I had with those two ladies, I didn't know who I was talking to. And so they were sitting there, and I explained to him the whole situation. I showed him a video, and one of the ladies spoke up and said, Can I see that? And I said, Yes, ma'am. And so it's a little clip, video clip, about what we do with the Love Project. And she said, Ma'am, you need to get in touch with the mayor. And I said, Well, ma'am, I, I have no contacts for him. I said, Honestly, I don't know anybody in this county except for her God leading my steps. And she said, Oh, I, I have dinner with him every Sunday. He's my, he's my cousin. I said, oh, really? And I said, she said, yeah. And I said, look what my God done done. <laughs> so we ended up, I got some numbers from that gentleman. He had some other work to do, and me and the lady struck up a conversation. Well, if you know anything about me, if I know you got a need, we're going to pray. We're going to seek God about it. We're going to get it handled with, right? So one of the ladies who I was speaking with had recently had a stroke, and God had been restoring some of her health and feeling and all that going on. Well, we ended up having prayer. Well, wouldn't you know the Lord showed up and showed out, and showed out, and so a prophetic word come forth. And so I went, and, she, and I said, listen, I want to know the answer to this prayer when you get your answer. I said, let me go out to the car and let me get another business card for you. So I stepped out to the car, and I come back. And, honey, when I come back, she had the mayor on the phone, and the other lady had the ch head chamber of commerce on the telephone. And they said, here she is. She wants to talk to you. And I was like, oh, Father, yes, how you do, sir? Yes, sir, how are you doing? Ended up, walked in the county, didn't know who or where I was going, but look what God done done. I ended up talking with the mayor, the, all the, cha the chamber of commerce, and what was the other... Uh, County commissioners, I got to talk to them all while we were sitting right there. Look what my God done done. <laughs> so these two ladies plus the mayor, the chamber of commerce, and the county commissioners are all looking, and they have a ministerial board for their county. And so the uh, ministerial board, they're meeting, and they had a planning meeting at the end of June, and so we're hoping to get together. We're getting past the 4th of July, getting things settled in, and hopefully I'll be able to talk to them next week. Look what God done done. Walked in the county, didn't know nobody, and walked out and knew the mayor, chamber of commerce, and the, and the other guys, all that, all put together. And God's working this thing out. So I just wanted to give you all a testimony and tell you how God works things out if you're willing to say yes, if you're willing to be faithful, if you're willing to do what the Lord says. If he says turn right, you turn right. If he says turn left, you turn left. If you even got to Google it and get to the wrong place to get you to the right place, you're not going in the wrong direction. God is putting you on a journey that gets you to the full effect of what he needs to take place in your life. And that is through faith. If we had not said ye yes 10 years ago or 9 years ago to the Love Project, where would we be now? How many lives would have been touched? Yes, God would have made sure that they were touched in other ways, I feel sure. But God, out of one yes, over the years, our largest year was 3,500. Uh, last year was 11, th 11, 1,143. Our lowest year was 416 families. But look what God is able to do with one yes and people that are saying, God, here I am, use me in my little so that you can make it much. Amen? So with that, you say yes, but what's God asking of you? The Bible says, they that hunger and thirst for my righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the Lord asked me that question again this morning when he said, how hungry are you? How thirsty are you? If you're hungry enough and you're thirsty enough, for his righteousness, God will make a way every single time. Amen? Amen. Stand to your feet one more time. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the anointing of God. We thank you for faith increasing like never before. Father, we thank you that we're hungry and thirsty for real righteousness. And your word said that we shall be filled. God, I thank you that every household represented in here this morning, if there's a need that it is met, it is 
satisfied in your word. God, every desire is fulfilled and every body is healed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Father, let the anointing of God destroy the yoke the enemy has tried to place upon their necks. And God, I thank you that we take upon you your grace, your faith, upon us your grace and your faith that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Father, for you, we are faithful to your word. I thank you that faithfulness awakens in the people's hearts a commitment to do your will more than anything else. God, I thank you for it right now. Now, Lord, we just pray for Jeremy that, he's, that he brings forth the word that the anointing of God would be like fire and honey off of his lips, God. The Lord, when he opens up his mouth, is a point of contact for the anointing and that word coming forth is a two-edged sword, one to cut and the other side to heal. Father, I thank you that you're opening up such a manner that healing wounds are taking place in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give the Lord another hand as you're seated. Amen. If you would, grab a Bible and go with me to Psalm 1. And we'll do verses 1 through 3. And uh, I just wanted Nikki to share what was on her heart and talk about the love project or whatever the Lord led her to do. Because there was a key element in that. If you notice somebody will, will ask me sometimes, you know, uh, why don't you pray before you preach? You have Nikki pray. And I do that anytime she feels led to. Or anytime I get the chance, I'll have her pray before I preach for one simple reason. She's praying in English to where y'all can understand her. And I'm over here on the side just praying in the spirit. See, I, I just feel led to share this with somebody that maybe you need wisdom, you need direction. When we went into Perry County, what were we doing? We were praying in the Holy Ghost. Somebody will say, brother, I need wisdom. I need direction. All right, well, let me help you. The Bible said that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Yeah. Now, where does he live? Is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Bible said you have the mind of Christ. Well, I can prove that's not up here in your brain. How do I know that? Because Jesus would never forget where he put the car keys this morning. <laughs> He'd never forget where the TV remote was. Come on. So where's the mind of Christ? It's right down here in your spirit. The Bible said you have an umption from the Holy One. And you know all things. So if you really want to walk in God's wisdom, the first thing to do is quit saying, I don't know. Yes. Quit running around. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. I don't know how I'm going to handle that. Help me, Lord. I don't know. God's in heaven saying, yeah, I know that already. <laughs> That's obvious. But I gave you a way to find out. And without breaking it down, because this is a whole separate teaching, I was talking to somebody the other day and you know, Jesus used parables when he taught. So let me give you one right now. Y'all remember those old-fashioned wells that you had to take a bucket and let the bucket down to draw water out? You've got a well of wisdom in your spirit right now. All the wisdom you ever need for any situation you're dealing with is in that well. Now, praying in tongues is letting the bucket down. That's how you get the wisdom out of that well, out of your spirit and into your understanding. And that's a whole other time teaching I don't have time to develop, but praise the Lord. There it is. Psalm 1, starting at verse 1, if you have it, say amen. amen. We're going to talk this morning about becoming a tree of blessing. And I'm going to quote from the New Living Translation. It says, oh, the joy of, the ma of, of those who don't Follow the advice of sinner of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. They meditate in it day and night. They are like trees planted by the rivers of water, bearing fruit in their season. Their leaves never wither. They prosper in all they do. And so we're going to talk about becoming trees. I could really just take those first couple of verses and really break those down and teach on them. But God gave me the assignment to go to that third verse uh, right off the bat this morning. Trees in the Bible represent people. The Bible talks about the anointing in Isaiah 61. Jesus quoted about his ministry. And he said this in verse 3. He said, 
uh, this is the purpose for the anointing we're talking about. He said, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. There's another verse I love in Psalm 92 where the Bible said, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Why, why do I like that? When we talk about you being a tree of righteousness, we're talking about a tree is something that stands firm. It's something that stands strong. And God's intention for his people is that no matter what comes their way, no matter what they have to deal with, they stand strong until the victory has been seen. Notice I didn't say that they stand strong till a victory has been won. Because if we're just standing strong till a victory has been won, we could sit down already. Jesus already won the victory when he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. The deal with you is you're not trying to get the victory. Your job is just to stand in the victory Jesus already gave you and say, no matter what comes my way, I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. And it's the knowledge of what Jesus did for me and the victory he's already accomplished that enables me to stand strong. But he said something about this tree. He said this tree, they'll become like trees planted by the rivers of water. Now think about this. If I'm planted by a river of water, I don't have to worry if a drought comes my way. I don't have to worry if a recession comes my way. Because this river he's talking about ain't drying up. My rivers in the Bible represent a lot of things. They represent the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, He that believes on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Rivers represent blessing. In uh, <clears throat> Psalm 36, 10, the Bible talks about the Lord making us drink from the river of his pleasure. From the river of his joy, in other words, the river of his delight. And if I'm constantly drinking in the presence of God, my roots are going to go down to where nothing can move me. The Apostle Paul talked about being rooted and grounded. In Ephesians chapter 3, he was praying for the church. He was praying for Christians to grow up. I don't know about you, but I think we need a whole lot more prayer along those lines in the day and hour we're living in. There are some folk the Apostle Paul wrote to and said, I grieve, I weep for you because now when you should be teachers, I'm still having to teach you. Yeah. He talked to other folk and said, I'm, I'm praying for you because when you should be on meat, you're still on milk. Yeah. This was his prayer for the church and I'm just going to read verse 17. But it would do all of us good to take this prayer out of Ephesians 3 and pray it over ourselves on a daily basis. Here's what he said. He said, that Christ may make his home in your heart as you trust in him and that you may be rooted and grounded in love. I like that. What are my roots going down to? I'm being rooted and grounded in love. Why? Because the Bible, first of all, said love never fails. Somebody said, well, brother, I try to walk in love. See, if I'm being rooted and grounded in something, that tree... Uh, uh, right out here, whatever tree is in your front yard, it's not going. Man, I'm trying to stay connected to the soil. I'm doing the best I can to stay connected to the soil. Man, it's being tempted to just jump out of the soil, but I'm doing everything I can. No, honey, that tree's got roots going down. You can't just pick that tree up and move it and get it out of the soil because it's rooted in that thing. We need to get to the point that the devil can't just move us out of love whenever we get tempted to. We say, you know what? I'm rooted. I'm grounded in the love of God. And I don't care what happens to me. I don't care what somebody says. I don't care what anybody else does. I love them and I'm not going to stop loving them with the love of God because if I keep on walking in love, I'm going to walk in victory. Amen. Now, I'm not saying the situations won't come your way to get you frustrated. Nikki and I have been married for uh, 15 years this past February. And she is an awesome woman. I'm glad I married her. And have I ever been frustrated or has she ever been frustrated over the last 15 years? <laughs> I'll give you a clue. We're human. <laughs> but guess what I found out? I've learned that a whole lot of times whenever you're frustrated about something, it's really not the other person's problem. 
It's real nice. It kind of reminds me of a kind of a humorous situation that came up a few years ago. Sometimes we think the blame goes on everybody else when it's really us at fault. Amen. Nikki and I, we travel a whole lot of places. We stay at a whole lot of places that aren't ours, sleep in a whole lot of beds that are not ours. We have a, a whole lot of bathrooms that we have to go to in the places we stay that aren't ours. And you know what the problem is? Whenever you're using a strange bathroom, you never know what is in that drawer. I mean, you put all your stuff in the drawer wherever you go, but people don't always think about where they put their stuff. Come on, somebody. And so, one time we were staying at this place, and I was getting ready for dinner. I went in the bathroom, and I went to brush my teeth. I go in the drawer. I pull this little tube out. It felt like a toothpaste tube. It had a lid like a toothpaste tube. So what was I supposed to assume it was? I take it. I put that stuff on my toothbrush. I go to brushing my teeth. That was the worst tasting toothpaste I've ever tasted in my life. And I'm just fussing. And Nikki and I had just had a conversation. Because now we don't think with a poverty mindset, but we do try to be good stewards. And so Nikki will shop. She's a coupon shopper. She'll find the best deals. I mean, it's, it's amazing some of the deals she finds. But one conversation I've had with her was this. There are some things you don't skimp on. There are some things I don't care if it's on clearance and it's 25 cents. There are some things you don't skimp on. And toothpaste is one of those things. So I'm brushing my teeth with this stuff. My teeth don't even feel like they're getting clean. My breath, I believe, smells worse now than it did before. And the thought crossed my mind. Nikki struck again. She went out and bought that cheap toothpaste after I told her not to. After I asked her not to ever switch brands on toothpaste or skimp on toothpaste again. She's going out and bought that cheap toothpaste. Man, this stuff's nasty. I got done, rinsed my little mouth out, took that little tube, and I was going to have another conversation with my wife. I walk out of that strange bathroom I was in. I go out there. I was, I was almost proud of myself. She was out there putting her makeup on and doing what, whatever it is you ladies do, getting ready to go eat. I held that little tube up. I said, honey, what is this? She said, that's preparation H. <laughs> now see, there I was blaming Nikki for the situation. And Nikki's not the one that had the problem. It was me that had the issue. And I was being tempted to get angry. <laughs> and I told Nikki, I thought there might be some joy here this morning. But here I was getting aggravated with her. She ain't the one that's got the problem. <laughs> and a whole lot of times we'll get upset with somebody. We'll get all mad at somebody. When if we would just look in the mirror for a minute, we'd realize we're the ones that misunderstood the situation. We're the one got the problem. Because see, here's the thing. Nobody can make me stop walking in love. Walking in love is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. I just love doing weddings. I've got one coming up in October. But sometimes I feel sorry for young couples. Because they, they just got together. They've got butterflies in their stomach. They've got that Hallmark Channel idea of happily ever after and what love's going to be like. And I'm not knocking Hallmark, honey. I watch Hallmark movies myself, thank the Lord. On my Sling TV service, I happen to get all three of the Hallmark channels. Hallmark, Hallmark Movies and Mysteries, and Hallmark Drama. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Nikki and I, are the, you know, most of the time it's the ladies that like the Hallmark movie and the men who like action and adventure. Nikki and I are the total opposite. She would rather be watching Jason Bourne or something. <laughs> and I'm the one who likes the Hallmark movies. Total, you know, rabbit trail, but anyway. Young couples, they get this idea that it's all going to be a Hallmark movie, you know. They've got this fairy tale romance and they're swept off their feet. They're going to have the wedding. Everything's going to be good. And, and I know in my heart, just give it time because the butterflies are going to fly away eventually. 
The emotions, and honey, if you're attracted to that person just because of the way they look, I got some advice for you. Get a picture. <laughs> Take lots of pictures. Get a nice big poster and blow it up on your wall because 30 years from now, they ain't going to look the same way they look right at the moment. We got to be like a guy I heard about that his wife came to him and said, Honey, I just want to know, will you still love me when my hair turns gray? He said, Baby, I've loved you through six other colors. I don't know what difference that's going to make. You've just got to be at the point, I'm going to walk in love. I don't care. And I had to get to that point that even if Nikki had bought the cheap toothpaste, I was going to walk in love. Now, it might mean i got to pray through some other emotions. But see, here's the thing. Emotions are soulish. Emotions come from the flesh. But guess what? Right down on the inside of me, the, remember that river I was talking about us drinking of? Right down on the inside of me. I'm born again. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible said the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost that is given to us. Somebody said, well, how do I stay in love? Well, I'm glad you asked because Jude gave us the answer to that. Jude 1 verse 20 goes back to what I was talking about earlier. But you, beloved, I'm going to quote from the Amplified because I like it so much. But you, beloved, build yourselves up found it on your most holy faith make progress rise like an edifice higher and higher praying in the holy spirit and then it goes on to say keep yourselves in the love of god so as i pray in the spirit a couple of things happen number one i'm not going to stay stuck in a rut anymore well brother i just don't feel like i'm making any progress pray in the holy ghost more well, brother, I just can't get over this thing that's bothering me. Pray in the Holy Ghost in, over, in overtime. I mean, you're driving home from work, turn the radio off and pray in the Holy Ghost. You're in the shower. How many of y'all sing in the shower? How many of you thank God? How many of us thank God you're not singing on the platform? You're singing in the shower instead. Come on, somebody. But here's the deal. I get in the shower. I'll sing, but it's just me and Jesus. So I might as well not sing in English while I'm in that shower. I'll lift my voice and start to sing in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because number one, as I sing in the Spirit, I receive a fresh infilling. Number two, as I sing in the Spirit, it's a release of joy. As I sing in the Spirit and pray in the Spirit, it builds me up, up above. I rise like an edifice, higher and higher. I rise above that offense that came my way. I rise above that irritation I had to deal with last week. You rise above that conversation uh, with your spouse about the cheap toothpaste. Come on, somebody. You rise above all of it, praying in the Holy Spirit. And praying in the Spirit will also help you stay in the love of God. And so when somebody hurts your feelings or you get offended with the boss at work, just take some time. Go someplace where it's just you and Jesus and pray in the Holy Ghost. If you can't get away, then stand there and under your breath. Now don't make a scene to where everybody on the job hears what you're doing. Come on, somebody. Stay on the just you and Jesus and just be standing there. Praying in the Holy Ghost under your breath and stay in the love of God. Secondly, the Bible said this tree produces fruit in every season. And I love that. No barren season. No dry season. <clears throat> no season where that tree dies and the fruit falls off or whatever. It's producing new fruit. And as you meditate on God's word and you stay planted in his presence and in the love of God, you're going to start producing some fruit. Number one, you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. In Galatians 5, verse 22, the Bible said, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And as you grow in Christ, the more you grow, the more of that fruit you're going to have in your life. See, I love somebody say, well, brother, I'm trying to produce that fruit. Well, let me help you, honey. Whenever you go out and maybe you've got an apple tree somewhere on your property, you don't go out there and see that apple tree straining, going, mm -mm. oh, 
What are you doing, apple tree? I'm trying to produce an apple. Man, it's so hard. I went to a, you know, we got all these seminars on how to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. I'm not saying that's bad. But you never hear that tree going, I went to an apple producing seminar. And they taught me how to do it. But I just can't seem to produce any apple. Pop, oh, there's one is. Thank you, Jesus. You never see you know what apple trees produce apples because apples are in their DNA. Orange trees, and I go to Florida every so often, and, and we'll drive through them orange groves. Those trees produce oranges for one simple reason. They're in their DNA. It ain't going to get mixed up and produce an apple. It's an orange tree. Well, guess what? Right down in your spirit, you, the fruit of the spirit, is already in you. The love of God we just talked about is already in you. The joy of the Lord is already in you. The meekness and goodness and gentleness. By the way, that word goodness, look it up in Greek. It's the word generosity. Yes. Kind of all these things, they're in you because the Holy Spirit is living in your recreated human spirit. But now it's up to you. Am I going to live out of my spirit or am I going to live out of my flesh? The Apostle Paul in, in Galatians 5 just gave the whole list of the works of the flesh. I didn't go through those. And then he talked about the fruit of the Spirit. And he's letting the Galatians know, you've got a choice to make. You back up to verse 16. And he said, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. Somebody said, well, brother, why do we have people that are born again Christians that aren't bearing that much of that fruit? Because they're not being taught to renew their mind and live based on who God says they are. They're being taught to believe whatever they feel that morning. They're being taught to believe, you know, if I feel like I got an anger problem, then I got an anger problem. If a bad thought crosses my mind, then that just means I got a bad thought. And you've got to go back and re-educate them. Listen, not every thought that crosses your mind is your thought. The Bible said we can take the shield of faith and quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. What are those fiery darts? They're thoughts that the enemy throws at your mind and shoots at your mind. Thoughts of anger, thoughts of greed, <clears throat> thoughts of worry, thoughts of fear. For some men, it's thoughts of lust. It's whatever the enemy's throwing at you. But here's the good news. You can say, hold it, devil. That's not my thought, and I can prove it. I am born again. I am the righteousness of God in Christ according to 2 Corinthians 5.20. So if it's not a righteous thought, it didn't come from my spirit. If it's not a righteous thought, I'm not taking it. It ain't mine. And then I can go back and start to meditate on the word of God. And the more I meditate on who God says I am, the more I'm going to act like who God says I am. Now, am I standing before you as somebody who's never messed up? Absolutely not. As I said, Nikki and I, we've been married 15 years. And thankfully, we got a good marriage. We don't have a bunch of arguments. We just have had moments of intense fellowship every now and then over the last 15 years. <clears throat> but there's a reason for that. We have passed up some marvelous opportunities to have an argument. Here's how we do it. If we're not on the same page about something, she'll go to her prayer closet. I'll go to my prayer closet. And then we'll pray in tongues till God gets us on the same page. And that's just the way we roll. It was four years, actually about four and a half years almost, from the time we got married until we had our real first, what I guess we'd call an argument. We were tired. We had been traveling hard. If you don't think 13 hours in a vehicle will do it for you, honey, you're sadly mistaken. And we had been preaching at this church and I had about two hours to drive and we were going to go to Nikki's mom and dad's. <clears throat> and it was a church that they wanted us to pray about pastoring there. We went and preached there a few services, realized that wasn't God's will, thank the Lord. And I got up, we had preached there that Sunday and we're going back that Wednesday night. But we were going to spend a few days at Nikki's mom and dad's. We get up and uh, I'm starting to load the car. This is another thing you don't know about Nikki and I. We're a perfect match. She doesn't mind packing a suitcase. 
but she can't stand to load a vehicle. I'm just the opposite. I don't mind putting suitcases in the vehicle. But I would rather go to the dentist and have a root canal with no anesthetic than have to pack that suitcase. And so she's packing. I'm getting ready to load. An episode of Focus on the Family came on. And it was an episode they were doing about communication in marriage. And right down in here, I just felt this gentle nudge. It was the Holy Spirit saying, Jeremy, you need to listen to this. And I said, you know, yeah, I'll listen to it. I'll, I'll kind of catch bits and pieces of it while I load. I do the best I can to listen while I'm loading the car. And I felt like, no, you need to sit down and hear this whole episode. Have you ever tried to negotiate with the Holy Spirit? It doesn't work so well. Because he'll let you do things your way, but then you're going to reap the consequences in the long run. And so I said, you know what? <clears throat> I'll, I'll hear what I can while I load the car. And then tonight, this program reruns at 8.30. So I'll just uh, go load the car and listen to what I can, and then I'll sit down and catch the rerun tonight at 8.30. Or if we get <clears throat> gone in time, <clears throat> I'll turn it on in the car. So I listen to those bits and pieces. I go ahead and load the car. We start going down the road. Nikki and I were tired. We had preached two services. Didn't sleep very well because for some reason the smoke detector in that trailer went off every morning at 3 a.m. <laughs> You're just laying there and the smoke alarm starts going off. And so all kind of stuff going on. So, so we're getting ready. We're going down the road. And Nikki and I start talking about the direction we're going to take in ministry. Whether this is the right church or not. What we're supposed to do. So on and so forth. And it was one of those moments that we each needed to go to our prayer closet, but we were both in the car. And I started to say something. And once again, I felt that gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit inside of me. And I heard this still small voice. It said this, Jeremy, keep your mouth shut. If you say what you're thinking, all it's going to do is call, cause hurt feelings. You're going to get a reaction you don't want. You're both going to say things you don't mean and you're going to be miserable when this is over. So that's what the Lord told me. But I had yielded to the flesh right at that moment. I wasn't listening like I should have been listening. I, I, I had that gift that you ladies accuse all of us men of having. I was using selective hearing that day. And, and uh, so I just opened my little mouth after the Lord told me to keep it shut blurted out what I felt like saying, and I got the result he told me I was going to get. See, I didn't produce temperance. The King James Version says is part of the fruit of the Spirit. That word temperance is the word self-control. Somebody said, Brother, I got this habit that I just don't know how I'm going to overcome. You yield to the Holy Ghost, and He'll help you to walk in that fruit of self-control. And I didn't use it that day. And we spent three days kicking ourselves and apologizing to each other and then had to turn around and overcome condemnation. Come on. Because the devil will put a thought in your mind or whatever and then when you yield to temptation then he wants to turn around and beat you up for yielding to his temptation. And that's just the deal. And had to overcome the condemnation. When if I had just listened to the Holy Ghost and yielded the fruit of self-control was on the inside of me. For that matter, the fruit of joy was on the inside of me. I didn't feel like it right at that moment. Why? Because I yielded to the wrong part of my being. I had yielded to the flesh. But thank God, even though a righteous man falls seven times, he shall arise. So maybe you haven't been walking in the Spirit like you need to. Maybe you haven't been seeing the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Don't get beat up and condemned over it. You get back up. You start walking with God again. And you make your mind up, I'm going to yield to the Holy Ghost under all circumstances. The third thing I like about this tree, it said the leaf thereof shall not wither. Now how many of you know it's normal for leaves to wither? I mean here in about two months, the leaves are going to start changing colors. It's going to be the prettiest time of the year and... and all kinds of gorgeous colors. Then in about October, the leaves are going to start falling off like crazy. That's just normal. But you know what? If the leaves aren't withering, that tells me something. That tree's being renewed every day. There ain't nothing dying on that tree. 
There ain't nothing going bad on it. That tree is getting all the nutrients it needs. The, the climate is where it needs to be. God is preserving that tree and stopping the leaves from withering. And I love that. The Bible said in Psalm uh, 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who saves you from destruction, who fills your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And I like I claim that every day, my youth being renewed. Nikki speaks it over herself. I'm getting younger every day. I mean, brother, I don't care how old you are. You ain't got to spend the last years of your life in pain. You ain't got to spend the last years of your life weak. You can stand on the word of God and say, Father, my youth is being renewed. We got blessed to go out on the bayou when we were in Louisiana. Folks that live so, so far back on the bayou that the only way to their house is by boat. And I loved every second of it. Got to meet some of the folks down there. I got to meet the pastor of their church. Pray for them. They're not believing for a church bus. They're believing for a church boat. <laughs> to where they can haul people across the bayou to the church. And... Um, I mean, God's planning, believing God that we're going to get to go there and preach revival sometime. But, but uh, the pastor was going to come out and everybody just calls him the Rev. The Rev was going to come out and show us and talk to us about the history of the bayou. So we are in this little boat. We uh, sail right up to his house. His house a little bit up the hill. And uh, Brother Nathan, that's our friend who grew up in that area, had told Nikki that the Rev was one of the older folk in the area. And so the Rev comes down out of that house and he looked like he was in his 50s, maybe 60. Nikki leaned over to Brother Nathan and said, I thought you said that was one of the old folk. Come on, brother, if you're 60, you ain't old. I mean, I used to think 50 was old, but now that I'm going to be turning 16 with 23 years experience this year, 50 ain't looking as old as it used to look. But, but he came on out there and just walking fine, talking fine, not griping about any aches or pains, just moving around fine. And uh, started talking to him, kind of find out he's not in his 50s. He's not 60. He is 78 years old. Or maybe I should say 78 years young. But talking to him, you would have thought he was in his 50s. He's still going strong. He's young. He's energetic. Still full of life. What is that? That is God renewing somebody's youth. That's God keeping you strong regardless of the situation. Well, why do I get there? You meditate on God's word about health and healing until health starts manifesting in your body. And don't wait till you get sick to start claiming God's promise about healing. Get healing built up on the inside of you so if sickness hits your body, healing spills out on it. I mean, you keep on meditating on God's word till if a pain hits you all of a sudden, you say, hold it, devil. Surely my sickness is he is born and my pains he has carried them. By his stripes I'm healed. Surely he'll restore health to me and heal me of all my wounds. The, <clears throat> the Bible said to keep his word in our heart not let it depart from our eyes and clan our ear to it. <coughs> because in Proverbs 4.23, he said that his words were health, life to those that find them, and health or medicine to all their flesh. I mean, just open the Bible, find some healing scriptures, and take you a dose of medicine every morning. And then take it again in the afternoon, and take it again at night, and keep it in there until God helps you to walk in health instead of having to believe for one healing after another. And then last but not least, I love this. He said, and whatever they do prospers. Now, if, if, uh, if you believe in being broke, consider yourself dismissed because your poverty is in danger in this building. God is not the God of barely enough to get by. It's not God's intention to keep you poor and humble. For that matter, I grew up around a whole lot of poor folk that were anything but humble. They were proud of how broke they were. Come on. They'd go around telling everybody how broke they were. And then they'd go around telling everybody how bad all the rich people that had money were. And then the next thing you know, they'd daydream about what it would be like to win the lottery. 
Because, I mean, if money was bad, they sure wanted some. And, and they would criticize those of us that believe God wants you blessed. You realize I was the first person. My, I came from a good, God-fearing, Pentecostal holiness background. But I was actually the first person in my family to believe in prosperity. And boy, did I catch flack for it when I started believing in it. But there's one thing about it. About 2009, whenever they started saying our country was in recession, one of the very people that gave me all that flack started becoming a giver. And they told me, they said, you know what? I've watched you guys give. And I've seen God take care of y'all. This thing works for y'all. I'm going to try it myself. Why? Because Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Now, know what? He didn't say just enough to barely get through the month. He didn't say you'll get it back, whatever. You. He said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It'll be given into your bosom. And so, God's desire is for you to prosper. And the word prosper, you understand money is the lowest form of prosperity. I mean, it's not all about money. You want the highest, the best definition of prosperity, I believe, was given by a brother named Kenneth Copeland. And this is his definition of prosperity. Prosperity is the ability to receive and use the power of God to meet the needs of mankind. There's prosperity. And money is the lowest form of power in this universe. Prayer is the highest form. But here's the deal. God didn't leave money out of the equation. The Apostle Paul was taking an offering in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Paul's talking about an offering that he's taking for the saints at Jerusalem because there's a famine going on. And he's encouraging the church at Corinth to give. And in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 8, while Paul's taking this offering, here's what he says about God's will for your prosperity. Now let me back up a little bit. How many of you believe that you're saved today because Jesus took your sin? How many of you believe you can be healed because Jesus took your sickness? Well, according to the verse we're about to read, that's not all he took. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. This is when I claim myself on a pretty much daily basis. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. Now think about this. Jesus, before he came to this place, was on an, a planet with streets of gold and gates of pearl. Everybody living in a mansion. Everybody's need provided. Nobody's sick. Nobody broke. Nobody's suffering. Then he came down here, became a man, and came to this place. Well, that's a big enough step down right there. But Jesus wasn't poor during his earthly walk. The Bible gives us a list of ladies in Luke chapter 8, verse 1, that partnered with Jesus and supported him out of their treasure. And if you study it out, you'll find those were rich ladies. When Jesus was crucified, Roman soldiers wouldn't even rip his coat because it was a fine coat. It was an expensive coat, the kind that poor folk couldn't buy. Come on, somebody. Uh, another good reason we know that Jesus wasn't broke is because on the night he was betrayed, he told Judas, what you must do, do quickly. Judas went up and left. And guess what all the disciples thought? All the disciples figured, well, Jesus probably told him to go give an offering to help the poor. In other words, it was normal for Jesus out of his ministry to give offerings and help the poor. How many of you know that poor folks aren't able to take care of poor folks? I mean, we talk about the love project and how much God provided. Let me help you, honey. If God didn't provide it, we couldn't give it. We, we had a, a, a CPA just for legal purposes. To, to check out our uh, ministry, check out the Love Project, and put a dollar value on the stuff that was given away one year at the Love Project. You understand? I didn't set this value. They did. And I'm not bragging because I'm not the one who provided it. God provided it. But they valued that stuff at $1.5 million. 
I said, thank you, Jesus. See, that's the deal. Whenever you believe God and you receive those clothes and you receive that food and you receive all the other goods you're giving away, it's not about the dollar amount. It's not about that. It's about you being able to be a blessing to other people. That's what God told Abraham. He said, leave your father's house. Leave your country. Go to a land I'll show you. I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. I'll bless you, make your name great, and make you a blessing until in you and your seed all families of the earth will be blessed. Brother, we believe that God wants you to live in a nice house. We believe God wants you to be blessed with a nice vehicle. We believe God wants you to pay your bills and have plenty of money in your bank account when it's over. But it's not just for you to hoard money up in the bank. It's so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. And the Bible said if we'll meditate on the word, if we'll walk in the spirit, and we'll be obedient to God, that everything we do will prosper. If you believe it, stand up and give the Lord a good hand in here this morning. Vicky, if you would come join me, honey. Amen. If y'all would just put some music on. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in here today and you just got So let's take our medicine, lay your hand on your head, say, Body, body. In, the name of Jesus. in the name of Jesus, obey the Bible. Obey the, Bible. the Bible declares, the Bible declares. by Jesus Christ, I'm healed. Hallelujah. Healed, healed.